Without further ado, John O'Connor. Just a reminder that I can keep on time. Um, a few weeks ago, I was contacted, or I was emailed by the WinOps team um, that one of my talks had been accepted. And then I kind of looked and I thought, out of the five abstracts, uh, this is jokingly referred to at work as my least favorite abstract. Uh, but then as I looked about it, because when we were putting abstracts together, uh, we had a really good discussion back last January about, about this topic. And it is a very live topic for us in Puppet. Um, and it kind of answers the question, why, why are we starting with this on a day when all you have come to look at the really exciting technology and the technical, technology problems we have to solve in the industry? Why are we looking at what is kind of a HR issue? Well, several years ago, I was working in uh, quite a large corporate, and I'm not going to name any of the companies that have been with over the years, um, because some of the examples have been good, some of them have been maybe less good. But a comment that one of the senior execs there really stuck in my mind uh, because they were talking about the way HR policies were pushed down. And she said, but we're really techies here, so we're not interested in um, any HR issues. And I kind of, it really taught me because about six months later when the market really came up in terms of employment in the Belfast area, that company started to lose an awful lot of people. And that same exec plus a, a bunch of her colleagues had to go around to a lot of the other companies and see, why are you taking all our best people? And again, they discovered that actually HR issues are very, very key. And even though we are pa you know, very passionate about the technology, and if you excuse the expression, a lot of us are, are you know, real geeks. We really enjoy the technology. Interpersonal skills are um, a huge issue, and if you're working as a distributed company, they become an even bigger issue. So, uh, I was advised last night never to start with a personal slide, you know, or keep it short, but there is a reason why I'm coming, why I'm starting with this, and um, it, it'll become apparent as we develop uh, and go along with it. Um, I live in Moira outside Belfast, about 20 miles outside Belfast. I've been there for about... Um, 25 years, um, been about 35 years in the software industry. Uh, yes, I did start my first program when I was in university it was a Fortran 4 program on punch cards for an IBM 360. Um, and those were the days when the VT100 was real high tech, but it's moved on. Uh, that's my wife, Linda. Um, we were on a holiday up in the Scottish Borders area, which I would really recommend for great walking. Um, my three grown-up children. Um, one of the reasons I'm putting them on here, uh, because, well, as a proud dad, I will always talk about them anyway, but um, this was our um, Rachel's 21st birthday, and it was one of the rare occasions when we get them together, and um, Rachel is doing engineering. Um, she's actually now start thinking, thinking of software engineering, but the degree is mechanical, because initially she wasn't interested in it. And one of the comments she made to me as a woman, or as a young woman doing it, um, when she came back in first year, they, they have a lot more um, women doing engineering than when I started, when there was only four in about a class of 180. Um, she just said, Dad, all the girls I've talked to um, have dads who are mad about engineering. And I do remember even when, I, when she was a kid, when I was doing some construction project because I loved DIY, she'd sit, me, sit beside me with the tools and just always hand me the tool um, that I needed for the next. And, you know, I mean, I kind of tweaked earlier on that she was the one that was going to be the engineer. I mean, Victoria is a photographer. It's again something I love. Matthew is a gymnast, and I'm not sure where that came from because I can trip up on a stray floor. Um, but it always struck me about influences, and as we go along the talk, influences are hugely important. We may not be able to make huge changes in our work situation, but we can influence things incrementally. And um, 
as well as I would be very passionate about women in technology as well, and I will mention that later on. Um, other areas of passions, um, I did seriously think when I was younger about a career in theatre and I'm, one of the treats of coming to London is I get to Covent Garden, I'm going to see Voltaire tonight with two of my favourite singers. Um, love railways as well too, so it is very much the geek end of the spectrum. Passions help us, help to keep us alive and we're fools if we limit our, our lives to technology without considering the human element. And that is going to be a theme the whole way through how we at Puppet have come up with some solutions in the distributed context. So looking at Puppet as a company, um, our office, and excuse me if I use the term PDX or um, BFS, uh, because we, we tend to just fall into airport codes to describe our, um, our offices. It's fairly common in the industry, but only half the employees work in the head office in Portland. 25% uh, are in what can be called remote offices or work, workplaces, and 25% work at home. So 50% of our staff are automatically away from the office, and actually a significant amount of the headquarters staff frequently work away from the office as well too. So you can see as well that we're distributed Portland, Oregon, Belfast, Northern Ireland, London, uh, Timisoara, Romania, Sydney, Singapore, and distributed employees are all over the place. So one of the major wins is that we do have a global presence. And I'm putting the function there really as the principal function in each of the areas. I mean, we do have some development in the office in um, London. And likewise, there will be development in um, Sydney. Uh, but it does show an even spread of development support and sales in each of the areas, which a lot of companies you know, fi find that it maintains a um, around-the-clock um, presence, which is important. Um, joining Puppet, for me, was an interesting experience. Um, I've worked in about seven or eight different companies. All of them have had, all of them bar one, have been American owned. So there has been a significant global element. Uh, but Puppet was interesting because all my interviews were either done from Brussels, Kansas, or Portland, um, all over video conferencing. We use blue jeans in there, and I will just use that term interchangeably sometimes with video conferencing. Um, one other very interesting thing that stuck out was I was given a chance to meet the whole team that I was going to be working with. And by the fourth interview, I had decided, gosh, this is a company I'm really interested in working in. So as a sales technique in the interview side, it worked very well. Unfortunately, the fifth interview was the deep technical interview, which I was convinced by the end of it that I had completely failed. Um, this was one of my interviewers, and there's a delib deliberate reason why I put uh, Rob Randall's uh, Willy Wonka chocolatey founder up here as because he stuck he did this to me at the um, Choco Fest last year where he just referred to me with my nickname in there as the Irish Terminator. Also the first time I met Rob was actually after, half, after he had left Puppet at WinOps here two years ago and it is a big factor in companies like Puppet that you very often don't, don't get to meet your colleagues face to face or there is a significant time lag between the time when you start to form a working relationship before you actually get to meet them in person. So when I started at Puppet, again, it was a huge culture change for me. It was the first open source company that I worked with. All the other companies up to that have been very, very proprietary and closed about their technology. Um, Interestingly enough as well, as a huge learning curve um, in grasping how to work with two technology, two, well, Ruby, which is their de facto language, and also Git, because up to then I had been working as an administrator for Team Foundation Server, and it has a completely different style of um, source control. Um, my manager was based in Wisconsin, and my team was based in Portland, with one exception. Uh, with a colleague in Brussels, so my day generally ended as they started. Uh, although I'm working in an office with about 50 colleagues in Belfast, I've always been a singleton, 
working with people outside of the office. I mean, I, obviously, I do provide support in my area to, to my colleagues in the office, but it, it is very much um, kind of a remote worker experience for me, even though I have colleagues sitting beside me. Uh, I've mentioned about the very large learning curve. Have any of you ever felt imposter syndrome when you join a company? Yeah, because it's a, it's a universal experience of puppets, very, very talented people, amazingly talented people. And I mean, I talk about my interview because I, I was summarily taken apart at the technical part of my interview and shown what I didn't know about Windows. Um, I was quite surprised actually to, I, never, I was never seen the notes, but the feedback I got was actually those guys were that impressed with me, but certainly I thought they had to demolish me. Um, one interesting thing is got, it's got an interview, informal, but a very direct review structure with very regular one-to-ones, which are almost mandatory as weekly, which is the first company I've been with where I would meet with my manager for a one-to-one -one to talk about anything you know, our kids' health, the things that are blocking me at work, and anything for half an hour. And some of that, I think, goes back to the culture of the founder, um, a guy called Luke Keynes, who very much was, in some ways, a, a kind of person who challenges authority. And I think it still has his stamp on the company, certainly in the way that it treats its remote employees and its remote offices. Because from the start, it very much says, no, you are not an offshore center of excellence, which we will just spoon out work to you. Um, you are part of the company, and we will try as hard as possible to work as a, in a peer relationship. OK, um, there is always the head office syndrome. But um, I would say a puppet is considerably better. Interestingly enough, one other company I worked with um, over 20 years ago was Digital, where Ken Olsen was the founder. Very different character to um, uh, to Lucanis, but at the same time, very much an engineering led. And I would say, in some ways, out of all the other companies I worked with, even though the technology then for video conferencing was really expensive and done very, very rarely, it was a lot maturer in terms of remote working than I would have seen in some companies subse you know, since then. Um, the other big change for me at Puppet was there was a serious emphasis on code review. Any of you who've participated even in the open source company, open source Puppet will know that too. And whereas in the previous company we had code review, which really was just looking at the code and blessing it. Uh, in Puppet, your code gets taken apart and the PRs are not merged until they're ready to be merged, mostly. Um, sometimes things go wrong. But that was a huge problem for me because I was finishing up my code at five o'clock and then I would go home thinking maybe it'll get merged today and I'd come in the following morning and there were more comments. I'd deal with the comments and then go through and then maybe it'll be the next day. And that got very, very frustrating. And um, it helped later on. Uh, and it's something that you know, we've worked at a public, but it helped later on in the key relationship, which I will talk about later on. This is what a lot of my workday was in front of the video conferencing. So I would get to meet my team this way. Um, that's a giant rabbit which sadly passed away. Giant rabbits don't fill, last for very long. But um, animals are a huge feature of puppets, and um, especially dogs who are allowed into, the, into a lot of the offices. It makes life interesting. Um, Yes, and when there's video conferencing, things go wrong. And um, this is, can be a scene at some puppet meetings where um, you know, meetings have been interrupted because a one and a half year old has to come in and show daddy his lovely new shoes. And my, our site director talks about a stage when he was chatting with the East staff one time and one of them said, Nick, you've got to look around at your window. Your eight year old son is hanging out the window trying to get your attention. So let's look at what's the characteristic of a distributed team. And these are just a few characteristics. A significant number of workers in a remote office are working from home. Um, remote workers greater than 20%. And a time zone separation of greater than four hours. However, I would say even a time zone separation of one to two hours can create a lot of awkwardness. So the big question that governs everything, 
What is a day? When does it start? When does it end? Sleep time, recreational time, family time. Um, our previous so CEO, Sanjay, when we were out of company all hands uh, two years ago, a remark he made really struck in my mind when he said he realized he was showing extreme disrespect to an Asian colleague by keeping scheduling meetings that cut into her evening, which is her prime family time. And it's one of the areas where we would show the most disrespect when it, when it comes to um, meeting times. Um, and it's where respect and courtesy, this is talking back to the HR issues in the beginning, be, really do come to the fore. So the question is, how do you manage asynchronous and synchronous communication and um, decision tracking? This is just an introduction to the Windows team that I was working with until last January. And it shows the kind of global distribution that we were working with, with uh, three in the Portland area, um, building and working at the head office, guy in California, Mike, uh, Summer and Minnesota, James in um, New Jersey, me in Belfast. Um, Claire, which some of you have met yesterday at the PE workshop, uh, is a bit of a nomad because although she's based in London, she has been based in PDX. And every so often she turns up in um, Sydney, Australia as well too. And then we have um, Glenn Sarty, who some of you will know as well too. Um, the biggest deciding factor for success when you're working in a distributed team is an understanding or tacit acknowledgement that this is a reality and it's a fundamental characteristic of our workplace. Um, we refer to this concept of paying the time zone tax. It's quite a useful thing to keep in mind. And one of the things that worked in this team was we sat down and Kieran Haggerty, who I will refer to a few times as a manager, and um, I have to give a shout out to Kieran because a lot of the content here was content I got from him and we've kind of worked together, particularly since he, he found out I was working in this area because this is a very live area that we're still trying to fix. Um, but the team, even before he joined it, had already sat down with an understanding that the barriers were there and we had to work together to make it work. And we still pay the tax in some ways that are not good. So constant review, brackets, continuous improvement is essential. Some things work, some things don't. I mean, uh, Puppet as a growing company has found that we've really had to restructure our all hands, which we used to have every Friday afternoon as a shutdown session in Portland at four o'clock. And we've now really phased out of that to individual all hands at each site appropriate more to the time zone with occasional company all hands. Um, before I start about the nuts and bolts of communication and so on, I want to talk about what really is one of the biggest issues and that's your, your personal commitment and integrity. And just to talk about the job and in the individual with the concept of really, each of us should really be treated like a valuable instrument, like a Stradivarius. And when we're working with our colleagues, would I treat them like a useless instrument or something that is of real value? But it works both ways. And when I looked up, because I'd, I'd come across a really good paper in this years ago, and I was looking up and I came across a similar one recently talking about the respect for the individual, but then I came across the officer's mirror image, respect for your job. And you need to treat both with commitment and integrity. Um, there's a time zone orientation. Are you able to stick to a required task? Because for a large part of the day, you may be working on your own. And one of the managers I was talking to the Belfast office was saying that um, this is a key issue where you leave somebody to work for four hours or six hours and then you may be meeting them up at the end of the day. And have they really said what they're going to be doing at the start of the sprint? Are the issues getting moved on? If not, why not? Um, big thing that we need to remember is, is that none of us are perfect. There's no such thing as an ideal job. Notwithstanding, some of us do find that we work, and I have to say, it, it could be a time before I move on from public. You never know what's 
six months down in the future. But I have to say, in terms of coming to a sweet zone at the moment, I have, it has worked out particularly well for me. But there's nothing perfect, and there's days when it's really frustrating. Um, finishing off the slide, I, I do find it extraordinary that sometimes how large corporations in particular invest so much in remuneration packages and fancy policies, but miss the basic courtesies in life that are so important in getting the best out of people. Um, this came up as a concept in the last week or two, and it started as a pyramid, and there was a lot of argument whether it should be a pyramid or a set of boxes. In the end, we decided, let's just call it a communication stack. And I've put in um, two arrows here talking about immediacy of persistence. And this is one of the challenges that we're working with all the time in terms of interpersonal communication. It's really important that we keep in this concept of sitting as close as possible to our colleagues so we can um, solve the problems we're meant to. So from that point of view, face-to-face -face, um, trumps everything. But obviously, if we're working in remotely, we can't do it. So video conferencing wouldn't be next best. Then instant messaging, email and share docs, and then tickets as the last in terms of immediacy and closeness. But in terms of permanence, it goes the other way around. And this becomes very important in terms of decision tracking and how we manage things in terms of sign off at the end of the day and leaving breadcrumbs so that our colleagues can pick things up. Um, coming back to face to face, um, even though we work remotely, we do need to schedule times when we meet. Um, it was very interesting when Kieran, um, my boss while I was in the Windows team, he joined the company by this time last year and I just happened to be over in Portland for an extended period of three weeks and I arrived the day after he started. And he just mentions that aside from Ethan, who was based in the office, he said of all the team that you got to know the best, it was actually me because I was in the office with him and he could just form that relationship. He would mention Glenn and James as the, one, as the ones that he struggled most with. Not so much that they weren't great guys, but it was a full six months before he got to meet them. Even little things like you figuring out what height somebody is. Because if you're working at something like video conferencing or blue jeans, it's quite surprising when you meet them in person. Oh, you're small, you're tall. Okay, we shouldn't judge people what they are, but they do form an impression and it is important in how we get to know each other. Um, that extended three weeks was also very important for me in terms of orienting me to the Portland time zone because I had gotten very used to our sprint planning works Wednesday to Wednesday. So all my sprint close open meetings were a Wednesday at four or five o'clock. So I was always used to having a hurry day in the last day, getting all my work closed. And it kind of blew my mind that for the, everybody over there, they walk in and close the sprint and then they start it that way. So they are ended their week as Tuesday, not um, Wednesday. Um, The best way of getting to know the team, team get together is really important. Um, at least annual, preferably six months. Um, inter office travel, we love it when the guys come over to the Belfast office as well because that shows us that we're part of the circuit. Um, not least to the fact that they just love sometimes the somewhat um, robust sense of humor that we enjoy in Belfast. Maybe it's an artifact of the troubles, but we have learned how to slag each other off in ways that is just not politically correct in the Portland office. And what we find is even the HR folks love to come to Belfast just to relax. Um, I've mentioned time zone orientation. Another good thing is to take advantage of conferences. And this is something that we've actually really managed to do very well in the Windows team. And I should go back to the global slide. Because for example, last year we were able to represent Puppet at the three PowerShell conferences in Seattle which became a focus point for a lot of the guys in the States to get together. I spoke at Hanover and then Glenn was able to speak in um, Singapore, I think it was. And it allowed us as, ind as individuals and teams to get the feel for what was happening in that important area for us as a Windows team in the DevOps space. But also, and there was a particular comment about the Seattle meeting was, you guys are everywhere because the guys had done a whole bunch of 
different talks um, to cover different areas from deep PowerShell puppet down to just talks like this. And excuse me if I do express, uh, if I do use the term guys, because you get really told off in Portland for doing it. It's more acceptable in Belfast because it tends to be a generic term to mean men as well as women. I'm not sure of the usage here. Um, courtesy and etiquette using electronic communication. Um, I remember about 10 or 15 years ago where I actually did quite a bit of damage to my career over a very stupid email that I sent out that made fun of a colleague. Uh, working remotely, it is something you always have to be aware of. Um, conversations can be misunderstood. You need to keep in mind to be respectful and open and be aware of your audience. What you might say in a small Slack channel, because Slack is the IM channel we use, or the IM service we use, um, is different from what you can say in a wider channel or in an all-company channel. Um, and by the way, I'm not saying that you can say anything illegal or fattening either in a, um, in a private channel either. But when you are talking about technical issues, sometimes there are issues you want to discuss in private before you want to discuss in an open channel. We had a really good example um, recently, and I have talked to the participants in this, and they're quite happy for it to be um, discussed, where there was, what we shall say, very salty comments given in an open channel about the way things were done. I think it had to do with line endings, which are a big thing between Windows and Linux files. And the guy was giving out quite strongly that this was not being done. And one of the managers looked at that and he immediately came in and said, look, folks, we need to be careful of our audience. Yes, this is an issue, but there is work being done about it. We need to recognize it and not be um, knocking each other down over things that take some time to deal with. And the guy who'd made a comment um, thought about it. And you know, a few hours later, he put in one of the most fulsome apologies I've ever seen. And the end result was actually you know, it worked better because a lot of people had respect for um, the guy who'd made the original comment because he had taken the steps to apologize. And there's nothing wrong with it. And sometimes it's the last thing we want to do. But it can be so powerful in terms of building team cohesiveness. Uh, but the other thing that struck me about that was the way the manager rode in immediately with quite a sensitive comment, but he said, look, this is not acceptable. As I said, don't let things fester and humble pie when necessary. It is far more important that we're, we're, that we're prepared to do it. And I mean, I'm even having to think about it. It's not work related, it's to do with a, a semi-social channel of colleagues, ex-colleagues and puppets where I made some comments last week and I'm trying to think, no, I, I need to find a creative way of just rowing back in that um, because I know that I did offend. Um, Planning on meetings, um, huge area. The first thing, and this is something that somebody just said last week and put it up in a slide, no, um, no agenda, no attenda. If you don't even have a one-line brief objective of what the meeting is for, don't do it. Who really needs to be present? Um, this one sticks in my mind because of a previous company where... Um, we used to have these really big planning meetings and people would look at their phones or look at their laptops and then we had quite a, um, well, maybe controlling manager there who would say, put away your phones. If you're at this meeting, you need to be giving us your full attention. Now, the manager was correct about that, but it was a better question is why do we have everybody here? Because there's a lot of people who just aren't interested. There are times when you do need everybody together, but get very focused on who you do need for the meetings. Be aware of what time it is for your colleagues. Tools like Google or Microsoft Exchange are excellent with this because you can actually select alternate time zones to put along um, the, um, the daily calendar just to note what time it is in Portland. Um, I think Google maybe only limits you to two. Um, Outlook certainly gives you more, but at least in Google you can put what time is it now in all the time zones. And sometimes you even have to think what day it is, because if you think back to the other slide, there's a time zone or there's a dateline boundary crossing between Seattle and Australia. 
and um, we did arrange one meeting which fell at my 1am in the morning. But I was more than willing to join it because it actually was a big enough issue that we all needed to be, and I was asked, which made a difference. So I was prepared to get up. And um, while we must respect blackout hours, sometimes issues are important that we do need to try and find a way of doing it. Um, where I'm saying be flexible. And I mean, one of the things we're having to note in Belfast and Timisoara, particularly because that's 10 hours Timisoara, Romania, from Seattle, which is a particularly awkward time, that quite a lot of the Portland um, staff have really gotten into the habit of getting up at six from home and doing a good hour or two of meetings to get a good overlap. And that's a huge sign of respect to us. So to me, it does mean that I have to show the corresponding respect and sometimes, well, our working hours are flexible enough that we can start late and work late if needs be. Um, huge issue, and Kieran talks about a time when um, he um, cancelled a meeting at short notice when Glenn was fast asleep and Glenn woke up early to attend a meeting and discovered it had been cancelled. You do have to cancel things 24 hours in advance if you've got remote colleagues, particularly if they're sleeping and they don't know about it or if they've arranged for a babysitter or some other arrangements to take care of um, young kids if they've got them. And um, again, you know, sometimes that can mean expense. Running meetings. Um, start, finish on time. Um, rooms in Puppet are at a premium. So if you get to the end of your meeting, somebody will come in and just throw you out. So we're already on a very good start there because people are used to the idea that the meetings finish on time. Um, in fact, one re thing recently has been to um, change Google to set the option of meetings automatically finish five minutes before and people get a reminder. Um, if the meeting finishes early, um, stop it. There's a lovely phrase in Puppet, we've just given you 10 minutes back into your day. Um, be aware of remote participants. If you've got a lot of people unbalanced in a one meeting room, one or two remote participants, you can have a lot of side conversations in the meeting room that don't take into account the remotes. Um, take notes and summary, that's old school. I'm going to be dealing with that in a slide, but it is essential. And the usual normal meeting hygiene. Um, One big plus that we found of some of our meetings was time shifting, where we would array, where Glenn would decide, okay, Thursday is my late day. So it was 10.30, he would have a meeting in the evening, which was about 2.30 my time and was early morning in um, Wisconsin and uh, New Jersey. That was a visual studio code <laughs> extension stand-up time. That project was done primarily between James Pogren and the East Coast of the States and Glenn in the West Coast with some participation for the others. And it is the single biggest reason why Visual Studio Code, which is Microsoft product, has now become the de facto internal editor for Puppet for Puppet Code, despite the fact that Puppet is mostly a Linux and MacBook workshop. The Windows team are really the only team that um, have Windows desktops in Puppet. So there's a huge win there. And again, it's something that we get from our customers. We recommend to all our customers now use the VS Code extension because it's got so much built into it with IntelliSense. It makes it easier for you to write Puppet code. Decisions and follow-up. As I said earlier, it's old school but essential. Um, you need to document everything, and this is where Google Docs, our tickets, become important. Um, one manager um, did something that was very useful for me, and this is in the original team, because I remember one of my colleagues dismissively said when I said I would come in in the morning, and I found it really difficult scrolling back through HipChat, because we had one colleague who used to pollute it with GIFs. So in between the um, serious conversation, there was an awful lot of rubbish, which is very funny at the time, but for somebody coming to scroll back is useless. So Mike Stanky, the um, manager of the team at the time, would send, up, send out two or three emails a week of the rolled up decision summaries for the team. It really helped me and he, who were the only two remote participants. 
Beware of tribal knowledge. This is a huge problem in Puppet because we do have so many talented people and there's so much of the um, knowledge that's in the head. Get it written down and we would use Confluence and as I've mentioned, Google Docs. And we are trying to work at the discipline in fits and starts of trying to get that knowledge written down so that when things go wrong and somebody has left the company or somebody is working remotely, they know how to deal with an issue if, for example, our VM pooler service, which would be our, our internal cloud-based service for managing large v numbers of VMs, goes down. Are there ways we can do it without calling up the folks from Portland to fix it? Shared collaborative tools. Google Docs are, and um, Microsoft Office is similar, where you can have long-running discussions over a brainstorming doc. People can put in comments. We can review them, work them back and forth. Um, sometimes we find that works far better than email, where you can just get deeply threaded notes that you can't work out what's going on. Um, all of us follow up actionable emails. This is maybe drifting a bit from the meeting one, but it, it sticks in my mind again from a previous company where our site director would always say, people would say, oh, but I sent him an email. Well, why didn't you ring him the following day to see has the work done? Or have you got the answer you need? Because too much we say, I'm blocked because I sent X an email and I haven't gotten a response. Well, it's still your responsibility to prompt them because you don't know what the size of their inbox is. Corridor conversations. Uh, again, with the tribal knowledge, we have to work at eliminating assumptions. Again, this is where things like the rolled up summaries, um, putting copies of key conversations, um, providing context for decisions, because sometimes you can go into a meeting and a decision has already been made and you don't know what was the background discussion. At least say that there was a background discussion between A, B and C, so um, the remote, <coughs> People can then go back and prompt and just ask more questions. Agree how decisions are made collectively, especially if they are made during blackout hours. Copy conversations to IAM channels. And um, in this one, try and avoid personal or um, personal channel chat, by that I mean chat to the individual. Try and keep the debate in the group channels rather than the individual channels. Okay, if you're wanting to know something, fine, use the individual channel. But if there's a hint that this is useful to other people, put it in a group channel. Uh, with a very interesting case there recently, because we've been dealing with a big problem. I mean, we, we have a wonderful... Um, acceptance test set up that um, when we do a public acceptance test we're able to test across the 40 different platforms that we release the agent on. When we, a full acceptance test run involves about two and a half thousand virtual machines spun up to do the whole test suite. But we're getting a lot of transients in that at the moment which are just down to internal network issues with it. And it's slowing us down in the delivery of some of our releases. Some of the guys in the QE team had written this tool called SIT, and a lot of us thought it was spelt S-I-T-H and reversed, referred to some character in Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones or one of the mythologies. It actually is spelt C-I-T-H and stands for C-I Transient Helper. And it was one of the best, best kept secrets that I discovered when I joined developer services, and I immediately put a link out to the dashboard to some of the teams using it. And they said, gosh, we didn't know that was there. We're really struggling with what are the key things stopping us in terms of this breakage. And it was a way of just abstracting or mining the data and just presenting in a dashboard. If you have tools like that, spread the knowledge in, inside the company and inside the team and commit to working in the open. Keeping the workflow unblocked. Um, this is a rule that I live by, but some other people have good principal reasons why they won't. I do keep um, Slack or email working on my phone. Um, most of it is dross, but if I ever get pinged directly in the evening, I will frequently respond. I will rarely go upstairs and take out my laptop and go online unless the stuff is really hitting the fan. But sometimes five minutes of saying, oh, look at that ticket, our ex can help you, can get somebody unblocked. And I do know I appreciate it when I get the help. So that's my commitment to it. And um, some people, for good reasons, can't. Um, 
I've mentioned earlier about using group channels. So there is, there's a traceability and people have breadcrumbs sometimes if a problem happens that you can trace things. Seek help and build a network. If you know your colleagues aren't available, who's the next best person that can help you if you're stuck um, with the best, you know, with the person you normally go to? Big thing if you're working remotely, if you're stuck in one problem, there's always something else you can do. Even if it is catching up in that bit of training that you have to do for mandatory compliance that um, has to be done. And it is okay if you're pinged late in the day to say, look, I can't deal with that, deal with it tomorrow, you know, I'll deal with it tomorrow, but maybe X can help. Um, I'm mentioning the Timashwara team now because um, I transitioned off the Windows team in January and I worked for about six months with the team here who are based in Timisoara, Romania. That's a 10 hour time zone difference from Portland. And it's particularly awkward because whereas we would have two or three hours late in our day when we would be able to get some overlap with Portland, they really don't. And 10 or 12 hours is particularly awkward. Um, so that six months I spent with them, they really thanked me for a few key things that I was able to help them. Remember where I talked about the PR problem that I experienced? Because of the amount of pain I had, I knew what it was like for them. And even though I wasn't necessarily able to approve all the PRs, um, there was a lot that I could, and there was certainly a lot of review comment. And also because I was able to do a bit more of overlap with Portland, I was able to prompt and keep things ticking over so that when they came in the following day, a lot of things were moved along. Um, the other thing that Mitz, the leader there, complimented me on was because I've been in Puppet for four years, I'd built up a really good network. And I was able to hand on that in terms of if something goes wrong, Gene is the guy to, to contact. He's also awake because he works in Georgia, so he's awake two hours before um, Portland. Um, James is three hours ahead of Portland, so he's a useful contact. If this goes down, I can be helped. I can help. Or there's somebody in the Belfast office who's very good in this. And again, they were the new team on the block. And um, I, I, I was felt quite privileged to be in that position because I knew what it was like for me when I joined the company. And what do we do about the water cooler? In a big office, it's a, it's a big area where there's an awful lot of just plain gossip, office gossip. Um, I mean, um, w one of the things I discovered on a Monday morning when I would come, I have no interest in football. Rugby is different. And it's quite funny because we've had the office sweepstake and guess who I have picked out of the sweepstake to cheer for in the World Cup? Only England. Um, <laughs> there was a very good discussion on one of the political blogs uh, um, about when an Irishman or a Northern Irishman is allowed to cheer for an English team, then there is a hierarchy. You can never cheer for soccer, never. In rugby, it depends who they're playing and if we need a favor. Um, particularly if it's France, because we will never forget when France denied us the triple ground the first time that it, we were playing in Croke Park. Uh, we did nearly get it there, except for a one point defeat by France. And uh, it's perfectly acceptable to cheer for England uh, when they're playing cricket against Australia. So some initiatives that have been, been with Puppet. Um, this one has been around for a long time, and it's called the Cross Atlantic Social Lounge. Um, it takes place at half four on a Friday evening, which is 8.30 Portland time. And it was fun actually being in the Portland office because there's a meeting room reserved for it. It's just a small gathering of people to talk about everything. I think last week they were talking about the Area 51 raid. It, um, it can be quite random, can get quite political, which can be interesting because, um, yes, um, when you talk about the last election, it certainly did raise hackles um, over there. Um, Donuts is a, a very recent one that I've only just joined and it's a Slack channel that you join and there's an app and what it does is randomly pairs up people who are on this channel for a meeting and basically you take a half hour meeting, a Google calendar entry is created and you just go online to talk about anything 
And it's been quite interesting, the sort of conversations that have started about people as somebody in HR meeting somebody in engineering, somebody in docs working in a completely different area, and the sort of interrelationships that have built up. I just joined it because I've been encouraged, so I still have my first conversation to have. Um, this is one that's in the developer services team that I've just joined. And Kieran, the guy in the Windows team, when I was telling him, the manager of it said, gosh, how cool is that? They have online meals together. So um, at, at designated, and they have it monthly or if somebody's joining or leaving. All the guy, remote folks go out, buy a takeaway. That's billed out of the department uh, or the team budget, and they just have a meal together for an hour. And it's just a general chat. And for the Windows team, we invented 10 Forward, which is an open 24 by 7 blue jeans channel, which is always available. And it's still going strong. Um, Glenn was saying to me in Australia, it's a lifesaver for him. And he drops into it three or four times a week. Sometimes I would be there and the channel is just open for three or four hours and we're just all working away in our terminals and then just chatting occasionally about an issue. Other times we use it for specific teaming and the general thing is if we're chatting on Slack, uh, it's uh, let's do 10F. And um, it, this is an idea that has been picked up um, as, as another idea for remote teams, just to have an open channel where we will drop on and just use. There's only one rule for the 10 forward team, and that is Mike Lombardi. Uh, you never, never ask him a history question, because otherwise the next half hour will be taken up with. I, I, I've never come across somebody who knows so much about World War I, World War II and the Middle East and just the whole fall of the Ottoman Empire. Office benefits and perks. Um, as I said, this is a live issue and Kieran and another manager, Norm, have shared with me retrospectives that they've just had in the last few weeks with the teams about what's working, what's not working. And interestingly, team swag came up as a, um, as a very big issue. It's always available in, in the head office. Um, does it get sent out? So there is discretionary um, money in the team budgets, and it's been suggested now that they use that just to wrap up some of the latest T-shirts or different things, send it out. It's a very small gesture, but it does mean a lot. Um, I've mentioned about the team, team lunches. On the other side, remote working itself is a perk too. It's part of the contract, uh, but you do get to work flexi hours along with the responsibility. Um, the last area I'm going to talk about now is life events. And this is going right back to what I talk about, personal time. These can be very, very significant. Mostly they're for a short periods. Sometimes they can extend, but they really do impact inv individuals. And companies can make a really big mistake if they don't look at the long term in this. And I mean, I remember two things stick out in my mind. One was uh, when I was in one company and I was taken over in the middle of the dot-com boom by a headquarters in California, which really ran it to their hours and their way. And their attitude was, um, if we can do without you for two or three weeks, we don't really need you. And... I had a colleague, and this will probably resonate with people here, it certainly resonates in Ireland, who uh, was in the Irish women's cricket team, and they were in the World Cup, and she asked for three weeks unpaid leave of absence to go over there. And of course the local managers were delighted, because it's a, it's a nice thing in Northern Ireland to be saying we've got a member of the Irish women's cricket team working with us. But her senior manager was heard to say in California, why are we you know, employing people who have outside interests? <laughs> it was like, you know, I, I mean, there was quite a culture difference. Another <coughs> excuse me, incident, um, very close fr friend of mine at work, her dad went in for some surgery, which didn't go well, and he stroked, and it didn't have a good outcome. He, he ended up with a really severe brain injury. And obviously... You know, her whole life and her family's life was turned around. And a few weeks later, her boss was saying, why aren't you back with us? What's keeping you? And it's, you know, people get really angry. I was, I was really angry to see a close friend and a very, very good worker who I'd worked with in several jobs, you know, well, in two jobs before, 
you know, thinking it is a disgrace that somebody is treated like that. In the last two or three years within the team, three of us have had three significant life events. My wife was very ill for a period. Um, another colleague's wife, quite young, um, got quite serious breast cancer. Um, another colleague had to move back to Australia because three of his parents and then one of them, uh, three of either his or his wife's parents all um, had terminal cancer and one of them sadly passed away. And even knowing that was so important. I mean, we were able to send flowers to the colleague whose wife, um, to his wife, and it meant something. And it's important to um, take that into account. It does reap huge benefits in the long term, even though in the short term, it can, um, it can um, mean that people are away from the office for a period of time. So overall there, it has been aware of the team despite the distance. I'm just going to leave you with one last slide here, which is the major learning lesson. We've had to learn this. We haven't got it perfect. You do need to take the time to understand the challenge and the opportunities that working as part of a distri distributed team brings and ask yourself, what do I need to do to assure that my peers, my coworkers, my team are happy and able to be functional in their day to day? I want to thank you very much for listening and be very attentive.